It's uh, absolutely incredible to have you uh, back with us here tonight. So excited to continue our journey. I, I want to begin with a question tonight. What, what is your, your favorite school subject? Or maybe for some of you, uh, what was your favorite school subject? Uh, this, this question seems extremely valuable right now, whether you're a, a public school, Christian, private home, uh, whatever it is that you uh, do in your schooling, what's your favorite subject? I'm assuming some of you are sharing those wherever you're at tonight. Uh, I, I was a, a big fan of history. Uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, physical education. That, that feels like the proper way of saying uh, P.E., I, I'll, I'll, listen, I'll, I'll, tell you the, I'll tell you the class I didn't like. I, I didn't like science class, okay? But I really, really loved science lab. Anybody else? I mean, science lab was, was where you had flames and beakers and things that were combustible and things that could explode. Uh, science lab were some crazy days, a lot of, a lot of fun stories. I know, I know it's hard for you to imagine, but I was voted seven years in a row class clown all the way through high school and middle school. So science lab was one of the displays of uh, that clownness. Uh, but it was, in, it was in science lab that we would, we would learn about solvents and we would learn about things that dilute other things. And I've been thinking about that word dilute quite a bit recently and I'd like to share the definition for you in case you're not up on Webster's. Dilute means to make, uh, specifically a liquid in this case, thinner or weaker by adding water or another solvent to it. This, this I know is familiar uh, to you. Uh, one of the things that we dilute in my house is, is lemonade and Kool-Aid, right? You got to get the right mixture going. Well, well, in the subject of American Christianity... Uh, one of the things that I'm watching and that you're watching with me be diluted, w watered down, uh, disassembled, it seems, uh, is the good news of Jesus, the truth of the scripture. That we're watching it in American Christianity with our own eyes. The diluting effects of taking God's word and twisting it making it say the way humans would find it convenient. We're taking the promises and twisting them ever so slightly to provide some sort of humanistic message. I say all that to say, I, I want you to know what we're passionate about here. In the songs that we sing, in the way we approach God's word, we long to teach the truth of the scripture, not man's opinion, not things that just caress our insecurities, but the truth of God's word in, in the fullness of it. And so I, I invite you then to take some of the messaging that we've heard about American Christianity and instead of diluting it tonight, let's celebrate it. Let's find great victory in it. And we're going to do that in our study of 2 Timothy. Now, just to catch you up, uh, this is the map of the scene that we're dealing with right now. You have a one person in a prison in Rome, and you have another person seemingly struggling a bit to stay confident in ministry in the area of Ephesus, you can see those two locations. Many miles separate Rome and Asia Minor, modern day Turkey or Ephesus, many miles. It's Paul the writer that is in the prison in Rome writing his last letter to his co-labor and disciple Timothy who's doing ministry in Ephesus. And so this letter of Second Timothy is his passionate discourse to this man now who's, who's probably in his low 30s is Timothy. 
as Paul challenges him over and over and over to take hold of the calling of God. So we're not gonna dilute the scripture tonight. Instead, we're gonna look at some very hard words that Paul challenges Timothy on. Let's start here, my friends, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. You then, he says, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. This is a common thread. 25 times between the two letters to Timothy, we see language like take heart, be strengthened, have courage, an ongoing theme from Paul. Now, I love what he says to be strengthened in and what to be strengthened by. He says to be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So, so how is a man doing ministry confronted with the oppressive Roman Empire in Ephesus? How could he find strength in a grace that comes from Christ? Well, I'd like to share just one. It's the same grace that you can find and therefore gain strength in right here and right now. It's the grace that says, no matter what you do, no matter how many sermons I preach, no matter how many people you serve and you love, none of those things dictate or define the way that you're viewed in the lens of God because of your relationship to Jesus. Listen, it's, it's so freeing to know I mean, I, I could preach maybe uh, something that was true tonight, but something that was technically poor. And I could walk away tonight potentially feeling disheartened about that. But the beautiful thing about all of our ministry, all of our life, is we are strengthened by the grace that's in Christ. It's him, his grace lavished on us that defines our identity. And so then it, it frees us to obey. I'd like though to focus on what Paul calls Timothy. This isn't the first time. My child. Now for a grown man to be calling a man in his thirties, my child, this relationship has to be pretty tight, right? Because if a 60 year old man in a demeaning way called me his kid at my age, I mean, it would, it would cause me to want to fight, right? We saw it in chapter one as well, this language of my child. Listen, I'm so stirred by this truth. Listen, the church is desperate right now for spiritual parents to fan the flame of the younger generation. This kind of flame fanning, the spiritual parent Paul does for Timothy. Listen, I want to share some things to those of you that, that find yourself at an age where you could be considered a spiritual parent. I, I want to contest to you that it, it can start much younger than you would imagine. That desperation that we have right now in the church, if it's met with this reality, we will see tremendous sanctification. Spiritual parents, listen. When you focus on people instead of preferences, there is so much discipleship that can occur in the church. Instead, what we often see are those that are spiritual parents. Again, those can be of many ages. They look at this younger generation through the lens of volume or the kind of clothes that they're wearing or their expressive forms in worship. And instead of seeing the beauty of the spirit moving through this younger generation and desiring to strengthen it with encouraging words, come on now, we often see instead preference, 
about music style and preference about volume and preference about structure of the body of Christ that takes away spiritual parents from the opportunity to make disciples of the younger generation. And I pray, I pray that any person who claims victory in the power of Christ, who's been turning your back on discipleship for years and years because of preferences, I pray that you will see the beauty of a 60-year-old plus man writing to this young co-laborer and fanning his flame. Listen to this. The global church will, will exponentially grow by salvations and into maturity if spiritual parents will rise up. If there are more, by the droves, thousands more, who all of a sudden step up and say, listen, I may be 75 and prefer a cardigan when I'm cold. I, I may not wear pumas like I do or have holes in my jeans. But one thing I do want, says the 75 year old woman and man, is I want to see a younger generation passionate about Christ. Listen, what about the 55 year old who's gotten a little bit stuck and rigid, saying I'll never connect with that younger generation. No, the time is now to speak words as a voice of more, to give strength to this younger generation, as Paul does so often to Timothy, may you be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Incredible language. And I know that each, each stage in life offers new opportunity at self-indulgence, but I pray that all of us as spiritual parents will repent and rise up, grasping discipleship a new. Now look at this. Verse two is amazing. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, he says, look at this, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So now he extends, does Paul, a very clear invitation to Timothy. I point you to the highlighted notes here. There's four pieces of this, four facets of it. Let's say it this way, four generations of discipleship. Paul says, I'm going to pour into you. I've given you words. Voice of more I've been in your life, he says. Then what he commissions Timothy to do is to give that to faithful men. Keep pouring that in. Share that message, and then those will share and teach others. You see this? It's the generational thought of discipleship. I'd say it this way. Don't hoard what you've heard, is what Paul is saying. Don't keep it to yourself. Don't enclose the truth in your heart. Let it be heard. I, I grew up singing this, um, <laughs> this old Sunday school song. I grew up in the church. And it was called uh, This Little Light of Mine. Uh, maybe some of you have heard it. And there were some fun verses to it. I'm not going to sing it because I'll be, I'll be way off tune. But it kind of said, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And, uh, and then eventually there was a, a verse that said, hide it under a bushel and everyone's favorite part. No, right. There was this like when I was a kid, even, even still, I enjoy screaming. No, just fun. That thought of like, should, should we hide it? Should we hoard it? No, let it, let it be heard. Let it be shared. How quick, how quick we are right now to spread current events and stats how quickly right now we're spreading all of the most current news as, as if we've gotten this gem of 
information, right? Many of us can't wait to share, like the, the next FaceTime with the family. Oh, did you, hear the, did you hear the next article? It's as if we get more joy out of sharing the current event than we do the thing that actually, actually changes lives. Listen, discipleship affects generations. Most articles affect moments, moments. And yet we're so quick. The, the rise of sharing current events seems to grab our hearts. And I, I pray that you'll see what Paul's commissioning Timothy to do. No, 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 brother. It's time. Generational passing down of the truth of the gospel. Me to you, you to faithful men and them to others. Embrace it. Timothy. Well, well now, like every good spiritual parent shares. Now, like, like every parent communicates. Verse three. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Can I ask you, how many parental lullabies includes this kind of language? Like, have you ever been nurturing your young child or, or encouraging one of your spiritual children, someone that you're discipling? And the ongoing consistent message is, listen, friend, it is time to share in suffering, in suffering. This is, this is the command and commissioning of Christ. Like, we don't have many lullabies, many songs, many kind of teachings about that. And this is one of the things that's been diluted, friend. Uh, the gospel's been made out to, to be this, this truth that you can step into it, say the right things, d do some of the right acts and, and then just kind of go about your way and, and then you'll, you'll score heaven in the end. Listen, there is so much beauty to seeing what he says, especially the fact that he starts with share. Come on now, spend some moments thinking about this. Share in suffering. Well, when we were kids, uh, I don't know about you, but I never got super fired up about sharing, right? Like sharing was always attributed to, to sacrifice. Hey, Mark, can you share your, two? now I had two younger sisters, so, you know, we, we weren't really watching this kind of share of toy very often. I, I wasn't playing Barbies. I was enjoying my GI Joes, but, but, but now, but now with my kids, Anytime I encourage my children, hey, would you, would you share your, your toys? They're not like, yes, I cannot wait to share my toys. God, Dad, thank you so much for giving me that encouragement. No, they're like, seriously, like I gotta share? Come on, like just give me some time, right? And so even the language of share comes with it, an element of sacrifice. Now, presumably, a Timothy is is having ample opportunity to back down in Ephesus. Because of the language here, because of the things that we, we see, we can make the assumption that Timothy is maybe even in action struggling to continue to endure in ministry. And now Paul, from a prison cell in chains, so share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. So let's not dilute this truth. Following Christ is more than wearing a uniform or wielding a weapon. It is, friend, a war. That's why Paul doesn't just say, suffer and share in it. He uses the good soldier language. Timothy, it's time to wake up. 
It's time to be alert. Timothy, you're in a war. Interestingly, he wrote earlier to the church in Ephesus that our battle is not against flesh and blood, he says, but it's against the rulers and authorities, the cosmic powers. It's against Satan, he says. We're, we're in a war. You need an armor, he goes on to say later in chapter 6 of Ephesians. There is so, so much that we have to wrestle with here. So let's start with this question. How will we fight if, we, if we're so accustomed to running away from suffering? You know this to be true, right? The thought of suffering isn't lining people up. The, the thought of embracing persecution isn't causing a, a lengthy line of, of draftees to say, yes, I'm in. Right. We're perpetually in the church running away. So, so how will we fight then if we're running away from suffering? Well, I, I think what Paul does is he's doing something that tonight we can find so much encouragement in. I want you to see this, be stirred by this, and understand the full breadth of Paul's encouragement. Here's what he's saying. Timothy, embrace your lineage. It's an infantry of sufferers. Again, the, the diluted form of the gospel we hear in America would, would never communicate this. And, and yet the pattern of the scripture is you have the leader of the movements crucified. You have 10 of his 11 disciples left. Now apostles killed for their faith. You have so many others in the lineage, in the family tree of the birth and start of the church, suffering, and if not to death, persecuted at minimum. And so what Paul does is he attempts through the Holy Spirit to expand Timothy's mind. But Timothy, you'll, you'll run away from suffering if it's just about you. You'll be disinterested and back down from your calling if it's just about you. When he uses the word share, it's not just personal from Paul to Timothy as certainly Paul has suffered much. It's inviting Timothy to join the lineage of those who said yes to Christ and therefore embraced everything that came with it. Now what Paul goes on to do, knowing that Timothy would need some imagery, knowing that you and I would need some help, he gives three very clear pictures. Let's start here in verse four. He says, first, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Let's start with the end. The aim of the soldier is to please the one who's invited him into his army, who is in command over him. He's making sure Timothy is reminded of the whole reason why he's been invited into this in the first place. To glorify God, to please God, to honor God. My good friend, John Piper. John, if you're watching, I'm sure you're not. But if you, if you are, 
John Piper often says that God is most glorified when we're most satisfied in him. And so as we find our, our satisfaction in God, as we trust in his command, God is, is glorified in that. He's pleased by that. Now, the first piece of verse four is no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. Let's, let's be clear of what he's saying there. He's saying a good soldier doesn't get distracted. He's saying a good soldier stays focused. Now, what I want to do with verse four, five, and six is I want to show you the effects of running away from suffering as it pertains to each of these pictures. So let's make this statement first. We run away from suffering for Christ by staying distracted. So one of the ways we distance ourselves from probable suffering for Jesus, persecution. One of the ways we do that, we run away from it, we back away from it, is by staying distracted. It's much easier to distract yourself from Jesus than to deal with Jesus. Again, that's the prominent thinking that we're seeing all over. I don't really want to deal with Jesus, and so I'll conveniently step in and do the religion thing, do the church thing, and then I'll just step out of it when it's convenient for me. No, no. The, the gospel disrupts our every, every moment. And, and so when you embrace the power of Christ, when you deal with Jesus, you're trusting that his will for your life is good, even in the face of persecution. Now, I think right now we're seeing a lot of uh, different ways that that we've been distracted. There's a lot of things being exposed right now, right? I think there's a resurgence of two things specifically right now that's showing maybe just how busy-bodied we were, just how easily distracted we were. There's a resurgence of two things. The first is the, the family meal. Now, I, I know some of you are single and and so your family meal has, has maybe consisted of a TV dinner, okay, with you. And, and I understand that. But I want to tell you what I see every night when I walk down my street. I, I see families gathered in dining rooms with the light on, eating dinner. And, and I know you're like, but Mark, what's the big deal about that? Well, well I think you'd agree the busyness, the nature of being distracted in our culture has taken off the family meal from the table. We've seen instead a, a running around. We're all going our own direction. Maybe we'll gather up once or twice a week. I've had so many conversations with you being encouraged by having a consistent meal together. It's showing maybe how distracted, how busy-bodied we were. The second resurgence is, is quiet moments. Well, Mark, what do you mean? Listen, there was no such thing as a, as a waiting room in the past. The last decade, a waiting room was just a chance to get back on our cell and catch up with some other things. But haven't you noticed what I've noticed? Hasn't there been this resurgence of moments? Quiet moments where you're dreaming again. You're hearing, hearing the voice of God. There's ideas that are coming to you or, or the scripture is being revealed in a powerful way. Well, well listen, I'm wondering what are you just gonna quickly run back to when the switch gets turned back on? When everything goes back to normal, will we find ourselves again quickly distracted? 
I'm just telling you, we will naturally run away from suffering in our distraction. We'll continue to build upon that here as we go. Let's now move to the athletes. Verse five, look at this. An athlete, so welcome all of the athletes to the stream tonight. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Well, every, every athlete understands this. 2016, Wilhelm Belotion, a French sprinter, 110 meter hurdles. He's worked his whole life, 21 years old. He's won some youth national tournaments, worked his whole life to get to this moment. The Olympic Games, here he is. He's in the block. Just before the gun goes off, he leaps out in his excitement and he's DQ'd. It's one and done in the Olympics. I watched some interviews of him talking about the frustration. You, you see him like over off the side, just, just beating the ground. I mean, th think about the years of anticipation of the hope and then he gets in the moment and because he doesn't follow the rules, he's disqualified. Listen, how quickly we can lose our witness with a, with a lack of integrity. I have, um, I have three second moments a lot. A three second moment is like something that passes through your mind that needs to leave quickly, okay? And I have some of those. And I remember being in college, Bob Costas had come to speak at our college. And I'm the leader of campus ministries and I'm sitting in the crowd with several of my friends and I have this three second moment cross my head that if I, if I stood up right now and, and, and just started using like crazy profanity at Bob Costas, I would literally end 21 years of development for ministry. I mean, there would be newspaper articles like, I would be taken down. I mean, yes, there would be repentance and I'm sure work through a process, but like all of this desire in a three second moment of obscenity. It's crazy how quickly our whole entire life can turn with a loss or a lack of integrity. So I wanna say it this way. We run away from suffering for Christ by cutting corners, charting our own path. We're told in scripture to run the race well and faithfully, but because of our selfishness or indulgence or three second moments that we act on, it's easy just to kind of make, cut the lap short a little bit, start a little early. Do it our own way. Look at the scripture and say, yeah, I appreciate the suggestion Thanks, God, for the, the book of help, but I've actually written my own book, God. I'm just going to continue to follow that. We run away from suffering when we cut corners because there's nothing to, there's nothing to suffer for when you're, when you're not obeying the Lord. Again, we'll develop this. Hang tight. Verse 6. Here we go. The farmers. The farmers. Come on. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. My grandfather was a farmer, my dad a farmer, my dad worked in the farming industry for his whole entire life. I then married into a family of farmers, uh, Heidi's dad and brother both farm. Uh, I've often offered my services. I'm like, hey, you, you guys want me to come and sit in the combine with you? And they have respectfully declined, every one of those. Could you imagine me in a tractor? I mean, I would be just driving all over the place, right? Uh, the thing I know about farmers is there, there's so much to contend with that you literally have no control of. And, and so every day you're just, you're just waking up working hard and then it rains, 
Waking up, working hard, and then there's a drought. Waking up, working hard, and then your machinery breaks down. I mean, there, there's just always, always things to contend with, always things that are going awry. I love that Paul uses the language, the hardworking farmer. Uh, the language of Paul, my favorite verse that he ever writes is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Here's what Paul says. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And it's his grace towards me that was not in vain. On the contrary, listen, Paul says, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. I worked hard. And he's not denying hard work for the gospel. He's saying, but it, but it wasn't me, it was him in me. I was laboring, I was working. And so here's what I wanna make sure we understand. We run away from suffering for Christ by spiritual laziness. I mean, you're not gonna suffer when your laziness has left the word on the shelf. Mark, what do you mean? Well, you're, you're not gonna suffer if God's word isn't prompting mission, right? And so your laziness is a, is a marker. Our laziness is a marker of running away from suffering. I don't, I don't want to suffer. And, and so I'll just continue to let laziness grip me. We say, I have no interest in denying myself, God. I know that your son says that if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, but I'm not interested I'll do the hard work in my career. I'll labor really, really diligently on my home. But as it pertains to the most important relationship in my entire life, me and you, no thanks. Do you understand how audacious that is? I mean, we will toil and labor for temporal things and God in his goodness has allowed us an opportunity to meet with him, encounter him through prayer, worship him on our face. And we're like, yeah, I just, I got, I got better things to do and, and therefore running away from suffering, which is why Paul uses these three images. Now, I wanna flip the statements and let's make this really clear. Let's start with the first statement in verse four again and say it this way. Your focus on Christ will cause you to stand out and therefore suffer. Not distracted, focus. Your focus on Christ, you're hanging on his every word. Friend, it is going to cause in you a standing out from the rest that will make you a beacon of light in a dark world. You're gonna, you're gonna stand out. And so in the standing out, there will be ridicule. There will be those that, that say you need to back down or simmer down. Do you know the amount of people that have told me in my life I need to settle down? The amount of people that have come to me and said, Mark, you're just too... You're too fired up about all this, Mark. You need to turn down the volume a little bit, extinguish the passion. And the thing I keep telling them is, listen, if the tomb is empty, if Jesus really is risen, then why in the world do you want me to back down? Why do you want me to simmer? My king is alive, I have great hope. And so to me, all of the excitement of the athletic arena pales in comparison to the heart of the believer who believes fully in the resurrected king. Your focus on Christ will cause you to stand out and, and so therefore suffer. And so that's what Paul is telling Timothy. Don't get entangled in civilian pursuits. Suffer as a good soldier. Share in it, stay focused, he says. Well, the next important statement, your submission to Christ it's going to declare war on the darkness. Remember, an athlete is not crowned unless 
He functions according to the rules. Remember, we run away by cutting corners. Well, then our full submission to Christ. Listen, it declares war on the darkness. Dark and light, they don't mix. Anytime the, the light declares war, Mark, that's, that seems horrific. Like, why would the gospel ever declare war on the darkness? Well, well it, it looks a little bit different. You see, the, the war that we declare on the darkness has already been won in the resurrection of Christ and now gets displayed through believers as we love like Jesus loved. That's the war. As soldiers, as we forgive as Jesus forgave. As we care for the orphans and the widows, that's the war on the darkness. You see, the darkness says people aren't worth it. The darkness says you need revenge. The darkness says don't forgive. The darkness says only love when it's convenient. But the light declares war on the darkness by loving like he did. And what did it get him? An execution on a cross. Friend, don't be surprised in declaring war on the darkness, in standing on the truth of God's word. Do not be surprised when the darkness fights back. But imagine when darkness is fully conquered. Ephesians says that there's been a time and a season where the enemy has been given rule, the prince of the power of the air. But there will be a day when darkness will have no more dominion at all. Incredible, incredible thought. Well, finally, the farmer, the hard worker, look at this last statement. Your hard work for Christ will result in his glory. The same text I quoted earlier, the, I worked harder than anyone, but, but, it, but it was because of the grace in you, from you, in me. Listen, it's, it's this kind of hard work that makes a worshiper out of us. And if you don't think if you don't think that full worship is met with persecution, friend, friend, it's time to be awakened. Those who are worshiping God cannot be quiet about him. Those who are worshiping the Lord, truly they see him in everything. And so in every conversation, in every interaction, they keep coming back to God's beauty and God's glory. And so, so to some, that's disingenuine. And yes, there have been some where it's just a masquerade. But to those who it's the genuine outpouring of their heart, God, I'm waking up every day and I'm laboring, knowing it's you in me, so that you'll receive glory in my life as I find full satisfaction in you. Those people cannot be quiet about him and therefore they will suffer. And so some of you say, Mark, it seems like you're sending a mixed message. No, it just seems like it's a mixed message because you exist in a culture that's diluted it. Jesus said, come follow me to a group of 12 and 10 of 11 were killed. He got them ready for it. And Paul now gets Timothy ready for it. And I now remind you to be ready. You might not suffer with your life, but surely, friend, if you've embraced being a good soldier, you will be met with ridicule, gossip, and a war against the darkness that will be confrontive against you. So verse seven acts as a, a benediction for us. Here's what Paul says. Think over what I say. 
for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Think about it, Timothy. Don't let these images go past you. Stay focused. Don't cut corners. Keep working hard. Labor, Timothy. Think about these things. I know it's easy to run away from suffering. I know it'd be easy just to go to Ephesus and hide in a corner, Timothy, but there's so much work to be done in Ephesus, he says. There's so much work to be done in St. Charles County. The echoes of the challenge and commissioning reach us here and now. So that's why I want to ask you this. Will you embrace the lineage Those walking in the truth of Christ who've gone before you, who who have said, we will deny ourselves. I'm interested in God getting the glory, not me. And so I'm gonna stand up for Christ. I'm not gonna be ashamed. I'm gonna be bold in my declaration. I'm not backing down. I'm asking Will you embrace this lineage? The infantry of sufferers that have found so much joy in the suffering, knowing that their life had purpose and meaning, knowing that they were pleasing their commander. Will you embrace the lineage? find yourself in the family tree. Now what's awesome is I think tonight some of you are realizing you've not taken your relationship with the Lord serious at all. There's been no suffering. Your life isn't at war against darkness. You've just kind of been sitting back distant from the front lines. Right now, friend, it's time to re-engage. It's time to turn from all the cowardice and say tonight, I want to share in the suffering. With all those who have gone before, with the global church now, we'll share in it together. And as this world eventually comes out of this reality, I'm telling you, friend, there is going to be a confrontive reality between light and darkness. It's time to prepare now. Peter notes the same thing. Echoing verse seven, of 2 Timothy chapter two, he says, be sober-minded, think about these things, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He's at war. He's in a war, the enemy, the adversary. So we better get alerted to it. Look at verse nine, unbelievable. Resist him firm in your faith. Look at this. Knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your what? By your brotherhood throughout the world. You're not alone. We're not suffering alone. We're not suffering on an island. We're sharing in the sacrifice. Together giving God the glory as we say, you have overcome the darkness and so nobody, nobody is gonna silence us about who you are. Yes, God, please strengthen us in the grace that's in your son. Strengthen us, God. Give us courage tonight. Empower us, Lord. Prepare us 
to suffer well as a good soldier, God. Take away any distraction. Make us fully submissive to every word that comes from your mouth. And oh God, I pray that you will purge us of any sort of laziness, God. Right now in our mind's eye, give us a picture of the eternal and global body of Christ. Remind us who we're sharing in this with. Yes, God. Yes, Lord.